we're going to be looking at chapter 28 here in the uh, book of Acts. We're concluding our study in Acts today. <laughs> Excuse me. And so uh, I was ill. Some of you might, might know that last week. Uh, I'm not infectious now, um, but I got ill. I was at the pastor's conference in uh, Philadelphia, and the city of brotherly love gave me a parting gift. And so, uh, so I was ill, and um, you know, I don't know exactly what it was, but it affected my, um, <laughs> my uh, breathing. And so uh, it's a little difficult to, to speak without <laughs> coughing, so I'm going to ask for you to um, please show some uh, Christian sympathy as I'm attempting to get through this, um, because if I draw a breath too much, <laughs> I in, immediately I cough. And so uh, just letting you know, and so hopefully I'll be able to pace myself today, just preparing you in advance. So, so here we are in Acts chapter 28. Um, I'm, I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. We'll read verses 1 through 6. I'll give you a basic introduction as I normally do. But I'm going to take you through the entire chapter and conclude uh, this, our, our study in the book of Acts today. And so as is my usual, I'll give you the, the verses, give you some insights into what's taking place, prayerfully uh, have some application for you, and uh, then we'll go through this, uh, this chapter together and conclude Acts. And so beginning at verse 1 in Acts chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. Luke writes, when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta, and the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened to his hand. So, when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man's a murderer, whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. And so what we have here is we have the Apostle Paul. Let me remind you, and those of you who've been with us in our studies, uh, Paul is on his way to Rome. And as he's been making his way to Rome, he's entered into a severe storm. And after 14 days in the storm, Paul and the other 275 passengers were shipwrecked. They ran aground on a place called Malta. That was a small island, is a small island in the Mediterranean. If you were looking at a map, it's about 60 miles south of, of Sicily. And so as they're grounded there, as they're running aground, they're on this island. Verse 2, the natives showed us unusual kindness. For they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. And so the passengers are now stranded. They're huddling on the beach. They're cold. They're wet. They're exhausted. They're on the shore, and natives have approached. And notice how he, he, Luke points out that they showed great kindness. They treated them decently. They kindled a fire. They made them feel comfortable. They provided shelter for them. They treated them with warm hospitality. It's raining. It's extremely cold. They're all wet. They're all uncomfortable. And so that's taking place. And as this is happening, in verse 3, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Now, I want to develop something with you, something that, that gives a little practical application. I want you to notice that it simply says that Paul gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on a fire. Well, that may appear insignificant, but I want you to see something. I want you to see that Paul is busy. What is he busy doing? He's busy serving people. And that gives to us a heart glimpse. It shows us the kind of heart that the apostle Paul had. It, it shows us uh, the heart of a genuine servant of the Lord. Paul is busy serving the people as any genuine Christian would do. You know, in, in ministry and service to the Lord, there are people who go above and beyond. Yesterday, we had quite a number of men here for the men's conference. There were so many people that John acknowledged, but there were so many people who were involved to make that event happen. They don't just 
come out of nothing. There, there are people working together hand to hand to make sure that these things take place. That's Christianity. That's how it works. And, and Paul was a great example of that because he's serving the people. He's gathering sticks in order that the bonfire might be kept burning. He didn't let the others do the work. He did the work alongside of them, even led. You see, there are many today who work with the public who don't, uh, don't really have a heart for that. They do the least amount of work that they can. And they have an attitude that they, they shouldn't have to do too much. Uh, there's this attitude, and I've heard it even said, if it's not my job, it's somebody else can help you. And we see that, unfortunately, quite a bit today. And that's a terrible attitude to have. If you're working a job and all of that and you want other people to do your work, that's a terrible attitude. Christians, I believe, should be the best employee any company can have. And working hard and taking care of the needs of others is something that believers do. It's simply what we do. It's an attitude of the heart. It's part of what it means to be a believer. When Paul was writing to the Galatians in chapter 6 and verses 9 and 10, this is what he said. He said, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time... We will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. He was completely exhausted, but he's serving the Lord as he's serving the people. And he's placing these sticks on the bonfire. And one of them isn't a stick. It's a viper. A viper is a deadly, poisonous snake, and it fastened itself on Paul's hand. And so as he's there with this snake attached to his hand, in verse 4, the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand. And they said to one another, no doubt this man's a murderer whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice doesn't allow to live. So they're speaking amongst themselves. See, now Paul was guarded by soldiers. They assume him to be a murderer. The snake has bit his hand, and so they're assuming that he had used that hand to kill somebody. One of my commentators that I use said that they have a sense of cosmic justice. In other words, he's receiving fit judgment for his crime. He may have escaped the storm. He may have survived a shipwreck, but he's still being judged. In Job chapter 4, verse 8, it reads, Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. In Galatians 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So they're thinking that he is getting justice, even though he survived that storm. The snake is going to put him to death, is what they're thinking. But notice verse 5, he shook off the creature into the fire, suffering no harm. So he calmly shook the viper off of his hand and went about his business. How could he remain so calm after being bitten by a snake? Well, God promised him that he'd make it to Rome, and he believed him. In Acts 23, verse 11, it says, The following night the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. If God said it, it's done. So he could be calm because he knew he wasn't going to die. God was going to care for him. But the islanders, on the other hand, they're carefully watching him. They're waiting for him. He's going to swell up and die in any moment. They knew that such a bite would produce a sudden and even a painful death. But instead of dying, Paul continues with no harm. So at that point, Paul becomes a recipient of a promise that Jesus had given in in Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, where he had said, these signs will follow those who believe. And in my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. They will take up serpents. That's exactly what happened here. Now, he's not starting a new movement of snake handling. There are churches that do that. They go out there, and their pastor handles the snake, and they usually get a new pastor every week. I mean, you just don't do that. You know, that's just not the right kind of way to look at it. This was God giving provision. He said, I'm going to provide supernatural care for you in certain circumstances. And Paul is a recipient of that particular promise. And so they see him as he shakes the creature off. Well, verse 6, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said, he's a God. So that isn't something new, by the way, said about him. We had seen that in the past. 
Uh, it had happened earlier in his ministry when we were in chapter 14. Remember in chapter 14, he was in a place called Lystra. And while he was there in Lystra, there was a crippled man that God had used Paul to heal. And when he had healed this crippled man, the people who saw the miracle were overwhelmed. And, and they said in Acts 14, verse 11, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And so when this supernatural event happened, it got the attention of the people, and they didn't know exactly how to judge it, and therefore they're saying, according to their own superstitious beliefs, he must be a god. And that was something that was common to be believed at that time. Well, as this is taking place, verse 7, in that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed. He laid, hand, laid his hands on him and, and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. They also honored us in many ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. And so... Publius is the Roman governor of this island it's called Malta. He welcomes them. He entertains them. But his father is ill. He's got a fever. He's got dysentery. So the hospitality and the courtesy that was shown to Paul actually opens the door for God to work. And Paul prays for him, and God heals him. And as a result of that is that the rest of the island begins to show up, and they're bringing those who have diseases. And, and word of this miracle had spread quickly on this very small island. And here they come bringing the sick with them that they might be healed. Now, again, that's something that we see in the New Testament in the ministry of Christ. In Matthew 4, 23 and 24, for example, it says, that Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And news about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all those who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed, and he healed them. So in his ministry, whenever he was doing works, people would gather around, and that happened in the early church too. In Mark 16, 20, it says, They went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. When the church was birthed in Acts 5, verse 16, it says, Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits. All of them were healed. And so this is something that was very common in the early days of the church. And so he had an opportunity to minister, and he's ministering to all these people. Notice in verse 10, how it says they, all, they honored us in many ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. Just a quick uh, touch in on the word honor. In verse 10, they honored us. The word honor is often used to signify financial recompense or a present. Paul had ministered to them in a very practical way. And they responded by supporting him. In Philippians 4.19, Paul had said it like this, My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And so what God was doing there was meeting his needs in a practical way because he often meets our needs out of the generosity of other people. And so that's taking place as they're continuing. So verse 11, After three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers, which had wintered at the island. Landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, we circled round and reached Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and the next day, we came to Pudioli, where we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And so the one who was accompanying Paul, who was in charge of him, is the centurion. His name was Julius. He secured a ship transporting them to Italy. This is a ship from Alexandria, Egypt, more than likely part of what was called the Imperial Grain Fleet. And so is on this particular ship. Now notice in verse 11, it says, whose figurehead was the twin brothers. So the twin brothers are Castor and Pollux. They were sons of Zeus, who in Greek mythology were the protectors of sailors, and they're traveling now. They're traveling 100 miles. They go to Sicily to a place called Syracuse. They go to the southern tip and to a place called Regium. 
He traveled on to another place called Puteoli, which is a seaport about 150 miles south of Rome and a population of 100,000. And so it's a good size area, and that's the point he's making. But I want to show you something here in verse 14, make, make an application. It says, where we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days, and then so we went toward Rome. Where we found brethren. There was a church there. <clears throat> Let me share with you a couple of things about this. This church had been planted by an unknown church planter. What this is is a subtle indicator of how the faith has spread so far so quickly. Jesus had commanded the disciples. He had said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So the gospel was not intended to stay in Jerusalem. It was not intended to stay in the southern portion called Judea. It was not intended to stay in the, the central called Samaria or up to the north. It was intended to go throughout the world. So this gives us some insight into how the church is moving throughout the world. The people are ministering and taking the gospel out, and it's spreading throughout. And, and it's not through the conquering of armies. It's not by forced conversions. It's by spirit-filled believers. And that's how God has always worked. It wasn't that long ago when Greg Laurie put out a movie called The Jesus Revolution, and people became fascinated by that, especially those who were younger who had never had part of that. And they began to ask questions. I received questions. The various people were asking questions about this. Is that what really happened? How did that happen? And the Jesus Revolution, as it happens in every, every revival, it was simply, it was word-centered and spirit-centered. God had said, go out into the whole world and tell them about me, and that's what we did. That's what the church has always done, and it did that from the beginning. After Pentecost occurred, and people began to re receive the gospel, and the church began to spread, and that's what was happening. God was moving in wonderful ways, and there's a church now that it's been planted by an unknown church planter. His name is not mentioned who it was, but there was somebody there who had planted a work, and God was doing something wonderful through that. And the church moves, guys. It moves not through the conquering of armies. It, it, it moves not by forcing people to be called Christians. It, it moves through the power of the Holy Spirit through those who believe in Christ. Somebody said Jesus was not rich, and he had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He was not a doctor, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He didn't live in a castle, yet they called him lord. He ruled no nations, yet they called him king. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He died and was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. And that's how it works in Christianity. The Holy Spirit comes upon you and you talk about Jesus. I got saved in 1970. My sister Madeline, who's four years younger than I, was still in high school. I went into the military. I came out a couple years later and she had already graduated. I was having a conversation with her, and I said, well, Madeline, I said, you got saved. You know, God was doing something wonderful in your life. I said, what did you do in high school? How was your ministry effective in high school? I'll never forget, my daughter, my, rather, my, my sister at that time would have been around 18 years old. She started to cry. She said, David, I... I wasn't a good witness. She said, it wasn't that I did evil things. It's that, it's that I didn't tell people about Jesus. She said, I went through my whole senior year as a born-again believer, a Jesus freak, and I never shared the gospel with anybody. And she was crying, and I hope you can understand what I'm trying to say. She was crying, and I'm not talking about buckets of tears. I'm talking about tears coming out down the side of her eyes. She says, all my friends that I could have shared with I didn't, I didn't take the time. She said, and now they're going to hell without me being a witness to them. She says, but I'll never, I'll never keep myself from sharing about Jesus again. Within a year, year and a half of that conversation, my brother had gotten saved. 
And I started driving from Norwalk, and I started driving out here to Ontario. And I started doing a Bible study. And my brother, that's when my brother began to invite people. And that's where I met a young woman named Marie. And Marie walked into the Bible study as an unsaved young lady. But three weeks after she came to her first Bible study, my sister Madeline, who had made a vow to God that I will never go without sharing the gospel with somebody, my sister Madeline led this young woman, Marie, to faith in Jesus Christ. And she needed discipling so badly. <laughs> I volunteered for the rest of my life to disciple her. <laughs> you, never, <laughs> you never know, you never know who you're reaching when your mouth is open for the gospel. I was in Philadelphia just last week. I was participating in the East Coast Pastors Conference. 1,800 pastors and leaders were there at the conference. And as I was down speaking to some people, a young man approaches me. He's not really that young anymore, but a younger man than I came. Everybody's younger than I, I should just say. Some guy <laughs> walks up to me and speaks to me, and he starts to cry. And I don't remember ever seeing him before. He started to cry, literally cry. He said, Pastor Dave, I want to tell you something. He said, in 1990, I came to your church. In 1990, uh, I was a student at Cal Poly Pomona. And I was invited to church, and I came to church. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ in 1990. And now he's an assisting pastor in a church on the East Coast. You never know who you are affecting. You never know who is reach, being reached by God and will do something, pastor in a church, being an evangelist, being a missionary, leading worship. You never know. And that's the power of the gospel. That's the power of a transformed life. And that's what it means to take the word of God and share it with people. Do not keep your mouth quiet. When God gives you opportunity, share with them about what Jesus can do and watch what God will do because there's a church waiting for Paul. There are people waiting there. It's an unknown church planter, but because the Holy Spirit had come upon the early church and they went out and scattered and began to proclaim the, the, the gospel, there are people who are being saved and you don't know how you're going to affect somebody's life when you open your mouth. I encourage you. Talk about the Lord with your friends. Now, it says here, we were invited to stay with them for seven years. In other words, they were gracious to them and generous. Once again, the Lord is providing for their needs to the believers. And then in verse 14, it says, we, we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. So Paul is moving on towards, towards Rome, a place that he wants to go a place that he wants to minister. In verse 15, And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as, uh, as uh, Apiforum and three inns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Now, when we had come to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with a soldier who guarded him. And so in verse 15, it, it speaks about uh, <clears throat> them moving on. And these people in verse 15, uh, the brethren who had heard, heard of them, they came to meet them. These were people who were Romans. They, were, uh, they traveled a distance of 150 miles. They heard that he was coming. And so they went out to meet him. And he tells us that the Apiaforum and the three inns. The Appia Forum is 43 miles south of Rome, and the Three Inns was 33 miles south of Rome. So what this shows us is that they sacrificially walked just to greet Paul and to show him love and support. And when he saw them coming, he thanked God, and the Scripture says that he took courage. This visible love, a uh, show of love and support moved him. You see, Paul had a love for this church and the members of the church, even though he had yet to really see them face to face. Romans 16, when you read the, the letter that Paul writes to them, Romans 16 closes with Paul greeting no less than 27 members by their name. Now, once again, let me bring an application. When I first got saved, I was taught 
that believers are family, that we belong to the family of God, and that, that when we got saved, we were baptized by the Spirit into one body. And God is our Father. Jesus is our brother, our Savior. The Holy Spirit fills us, and, and we're united in Christ. I was taught that. We're a Jesus community. That's one of the reasons why if you walk out and take notice of one of the walls, it says a Jesus community. It's to remind me, to be honest with you, that, that I belong to a large family, a family of believers. Now, I have a biological family that's very large. I, I mentioned before that my, my grandmother died in, in 1992. And um, I didn't know this. And now, this is 1992. I didn't know this. But I got the uh, information and it tells you about sons and grandsons, etc. And in 1992, when my grandmother died, she left 118 great and great great grandchildren. 118, 30 years ago. We're taking over California. <laughs> I mean, I have so many blood relatives. I like family. I enjoy family. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. I'd love to have grandchildren without my children, but that's a different story. <laughs> but see, we belong to each other. Church is not a group of strangers. It never was intended to be. Church is a body of Christ that we love one another, minister to one another, share with one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, fellowship with one another, exhort one another. Confront one another because we're a family. And we need to understand that. And Paul needed his family. And the family came. And they were willing to walk and to sacrifice, to be there for him. And he saw them and he was greatly encouraged. He thanked God for them. And this is the church at its best. When the church would gather together, it was kind of like a family reunion. And they were there getting the word of God, fellowshipping and being equipped for works of service. And he was honored. Paul was honored. He was loved by these brethren. They knew that he was suffering for the sake of the gospel. And they cared about that. And they made an effort to be there for him. And they encouraged him. It says in verse 15, when Paul saw them, he thanked God and he took courage. Now, when they saw him, they would have embraced. Perhaps they would have even cried. He would have had a reason to smile. He would have been filled with a holy joy. He's the one who wrote in Romans chapter 16, verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. When I first read that scripture, I was a brand new Christian. Greet one another with a holy kiss. There's a lot of real pretty girls. And the Bible tells me to. It's not like I'm all fleshly. Then I found out the brothers would kiss the brothers, and that was it for me. <laughs> but there's, there was a love and there was a joy that they had. Now, he's on his way to Rome. He's taking what has been called the long walk to Rome. And somebody said that this is what he'd have been seeing as he was making his journey. As they neared the city, the Appian Road would would present more of its characteristic features, the tall milestones, stately tombs, which lining either side gave to the road the appearance of one long cemetery and bore their record of the fame or the vanity, the wealth or the virtues of the dead. As they drew nearer still, Paul's companions would point out to him the grove and the sacred spring in the valley of Egeria. He would pass the cemetery of the Jews of Rome, lying on the west of the Appian Way. Perhaps he would see the beginning of the catacombs where the Christians, who were excluded from the cemetery of the Jews, laid their dead to sleep in peace. Continuing his journey, Paul and his companions would come within view of the pyramid of Caius Cassius, would pass under the arch of Drusus, enter the city by the port of Capena, Proceeding from there to the palace of the Caesars, which stood on the Palatine Hill, and looked down on one side upon the Forum, on the other upon the Circus Maximus. He's on his way to a city that has been referred to as, as having grandeur. And so there he is, and he's making his way. It says in verse 16, Now, 
when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So Paul has his heart's desire. He's in the magnificent city of Rome. It was his great desire to go to Rome to preach Christ in this incredible city. Remember how he had been taken before the Jewish council and he had ended up incarcerated. He was greatly upset because he was concerned. He wanted to preach in Rome. And in Acts 23, 11, it says that the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Well, now he's in Rome. And he's prepared to continue his mission of proclaiming Christ. Again, it says, We came to Rome. He had special privilege there. It says that the captain, he was delivered, uh, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So he had special privilege. He wasn't placed in a cold, damp cell. Now this special privilege may have come to the centurion who had grown to admire him. Paul didn't request his favor, by the way. It was granted to him as a blessing. God was caring for him and providing comfort for this time to come. Like it says in Proverbs 28, 20, a faithful man will abound with blessing. And so he was given a blessing and he was able to live in that way. Well, verse 17, it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans who, when they had examined me, wanted to let me go because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and speak with you because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. Paul doesn't waste any time. He desires to speak to the elders of the community it's now his normal practice to speak to the Jew first. He introduces himself, notice, by addressing the charges that have been lodged against him. He wants them to hear everything from him firsthand. He wants them to hear the gospel unprejudiced by others. You see, there were other times when he was preaching that the dissenters would interrupt in Acts 13, 45, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying, heaped abuse on him. Acts 14, 2, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles, poisoned their minds against the brothers. There have been times when I've been ministering on occasion, not often, but it's happened, where people will interrupt or they want to do something or say something. They want to dissent. They want to have a, an argument. And, and that happened plenty of times with, with the Apostle Paul. And so he's wanting to make sure that he's, he's speaking to them firsthand so that they're, they're not getting a, a secondhand information from other people. And, and he tells them in verse 20, for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. Now when he says I'm bound with this chain, the chain reveals that he's being watched by a soldier whom he is chained to. And he says he's speaking to them about, notice, Israel's hope. I'm here to speak to you, he's saying, about Messiah, the Messiah who's to come. I'm here to speak to you about the hope of life in Jesus Christ. I'm here to speak to you about the resurrection. This is something that we Jews believe in. In Isaiah 26, 19, it, it reads, Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. I'm here to speak to you about the hope that we have of resurrection. Remember in Acts 23, verse 6, Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees, the other Pharisees. He cried out in the council, men and brother, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead. I am being judged, and that's what he's speaking about. He said, I've come to speak to you concerning the hope of Israel. The hope of Israel is Messiah, the one who has been raised from the dead. Well, as he's speaking to them, verse 21, they said to him, we neither received letters from Judea, who has recently arrived has brought anything negative to tell us. We are familiar with Christian doctrine, and what we know of it, well, it's caused some problems. You see, 10 years earlier, the Jews had been expelled for, from Rome for clashing with Christians, so we've heard of this, and we'd like to hear more. So verse 23, when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets. 
from morning until evening. And so Paul has the opportunity to explain the gospel. I want you to notice how it says he was persuading. The word persuading means to confidently attempt to win someone over. He's exhaustively pointing to both the law and the prophets. Because in the Old Testament law and the prophets, Messiah is revealed. He wants them to know that Jesus is fulfilling these prophecies. These are not idle tales. These are not stories that have been made up by man. What I'm talking to you about, he's saying, is ancient promises that were fulfilled in a man named Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus had done this himself. Remember, he had been on the road. It's called the road to Emmaus, and he had been speaking to a couple of disciples who were disappointed. And he said in Luke 24, 26, and 27, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And Jesus went on, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So that gives to us an obvious reason to be familiar with Scripture and why it's so important to be able to present Christ in that way. Well, as he's doing this, verse 24, some were persuaded by the things which were spoken. Some disbelieved. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. The hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Notice some, verse 24, were persuaded by the things that were spoken and others disbelieved. Here's something for you to think about. We live in a time when if you say something in a bold fashion, if it's something others will disagree with, then you're going to be perceived as being harsh, judge, arrogant, whatever, self-righteous. We hear that quite a bit, and as a pastor, that's something that's very common for me as a pastor to be aware of, is that people look at me and people like me as being just simply bullies, arrogant tyrants. That's what we are. Because after all, you're saying things to people that they don't want to hear. And when you say things they don't want to hear, their feelings are hurt. And everybody knows our feelings are more important than truth. And therefore, if you, if you hurt my feelings, then you're mean and you're ugly. And, you're, and, they're all, and that's kind of how it is today. Don't, uh, don't ever go out of your way to be rude. Don't ever go out of your way to be harsh. Don't ever go out of your way to be mean-spirited. Be very careful that you're not. Ask the Lord to give you a compassionate heart. Ask the Lord to give you a loving willingness to share, even if people will misunderstand, and indeed they do. Remember something that Jesus taught, and I think this is something we need as a church to be reminded of. Uh, Jesus made it very clear that the gospel, instead of us thinking it's going to draw people together, the fact of the matter is, is when the gospel is preached, it, it divides people. It will divide you. Because it's true. I was on a flight many years ago. We, we were returning from, from Israel. My son David at that time was maybe about 12 years old or so. And we were separated in the plane. He was in the back, and I was uh, flying the plane with the pilot. No, I was, uh, I was separated by some rows. It's a long flight, and here's, I, I feel someone tapping my shoulder, and I look up. It's my son Dave. He said, Dad, I need you. He had his friend Matt. He said, Matt and I are talking to this guy about Jesus, and you've got to come and tell him more. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I go to the back of the plane, and there's a businessman, an Italian man, very handsome man, very handsome man. He's a businessman dressed up in a nice suit and clean shirt. Very, very... Uh, very stunning guy, he's very handsome. And so I sit down next to the guy. My son David says to this man, this is my father. And he can tell you about Jesus. And, uh, and I looked at the man, and the man smiles at me. And I said, it's nice to meet you. And so this is what my son said. He said, Dad, I told him he's going to hell.
because he worships Mary. He was an Italian Catholic. He is going to hell, isn't he, Dad? That's what my son tells me. And I'm sitting next to this guy, and he's like this, looking at me. What do you do? What do you do? Daddy, he's going to hell. He worships Mary. What do you do? So I looked at the guy. I said, ciao, and I left. No, I looked at the guy. (laughs) And I said, son, if he doesn't receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, this man's going to hell. And I looked at the Italian guy who at that time was kind of a, you know, I mean, but it's true. It's true. So I looked at him and I said, forgive my son for his boldness that may have been offensive to you. But I've taught my son what Scripture teaches, and that's what Scripture teaches. And he just, very polite, looks at me, and I said, but let me ask you a question. Where are you from? He said, from Rome. I said, you're from Rome? He goes, yes. Have you read your letter? What letter? You have a letter in the Bible. You don't know that? No. He said it's called the Book of Romans. It was written to the Church of Rome. I think it probably is wise for you to read a letter that was written to Romans, don't you think? He said, because in it, you're going to see the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You'll see in the word of God. And I gave him the gospel. It's called the Roman road. And I shared with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the things we need to remember is sometimes telling the truth can be, in the mind of people, offensive. But Jesus said this. He said, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. See, ladies? (laughs) A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. We have this idea that that everybody's going to just have a kumbaya moment. And that's not necessarily true. Because the sword of the word divides. That's what it does. And some of these people listened. It says in verse 24, they were persuaded and some disbelieved. You see, that's what happens. Some were persuaded, but others refused. Some desired Messiah. Others were content remaining under the law. And as this is taking place in verses 25 through 27, they don't agree amongst themselves and they departed. But even as their fathers rejected the prophets, even so, they continued to reject Messiah. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet. He's saying, let it be known to you, though, he continues in verse 28, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will hear it. You've been told. You've rejected. You can never say you weren't given a chance to be saved. God's work of salvation performed by Messiah was complete, but you want nothing to do with it. As a result, God's desire to save is extended to Gentiles, and you can never say you weren't given a chance. You need to hear it. You need to receive it. You need to understand it. You need to obey it. And there are people even today, perhaps listening right now, that this could be said to, heard the gospel plenty, but rejected it nonetheless. And that's what he's saying here. You've heard it, and you've rejected it. Well, verse 29, when, they had, when he had said these, these words, the Jews departed, had a great dispute among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house, and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Paul remained in Rome for two years. He was under a kind of house arrest. He continued his ministry. He he was restricted 
but not without fruit. Paul was able to write letters, and though he was in chains, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, he said, God's word is not chained. He used his time in jail to continue his ministry of teaching and evangelizing. When he wrote to the Philippians, he said in chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident in the whole palace guard and all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He closed Philippians in chapter 4, verse 22, by saying this, All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. You may feel that you are restricted in your life. You don't want to be in the place that you are because you'd like to be somewhere else thinking you'd have more freedom and fruit in your ministry. When I was, my mother was ill, she went to the doctor. As she went to the doctor, she walked into the doctor's office to speak to the, the doctor, and the doctor had a Bible on her desk. My mother loved to talk about the Lord, and so when she saw the Bible, she says to the doctor, she said, uh, oh, I see you have a Bible. Well, apparently that had caused problems with some of the patients who had come to see this particular doctor, and, and the doctor said, yes, it's my right to have a Bible if I want it. My mom said, chill out. She said, relax. She says, I, I, I'm a Christian. I love the Word of God. And the woman, she, well, you know, obviously she'd had some, some negative things said to her because of that, and she was very defensive, but now she's talking to my mom. As she's talking to my mom, she says to my mom, Rosales, and my mom goes, yes. She said, you don't happen to have a son named David, do you? And my mom says, so who wants to know? No, she said... <laughs> She goes, she goes, yes, I do. Did your son serve in the army in 71, 72? And my mama said, yes, he did. She said, would you do me a favor? Would you give your son a message? Would you tell him that Larry is doing fine and still serving the Lord? You see, what had happened is when I went into the military... My friend Bill and I had an opportunity to speak to a young man named Larry, Larry Schwalm. And in basic training, we led him to faith in Christ in the barracks. And all those years later, I never saw him again until my mom went to the doctor. And his wife said, Larry's my husband, she said, he's walking with Jesus. You never know who you are impacting. And though you may be feeling restricted where you're at, the Word of God never is. And you have the opportunity to see God move in ways that you may not even know. And so though he's restricted, yet the kingdom is continuing to press forward. So notice how he closes here. Preaching the kingdom to all who came to him, teaching the things that concern the Lord Jesus, and doing so with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Nothing is known after the closing of Acts for certain. Exactly the exact things that took place, it isn't recorded for us, but we do know that Paul was released, that he continued in ministry, but he was arrested once again and was eventually martyred. The last letter, and I'll close with this, of the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy. It's some of the, it can be sad in some ways, because when he closes 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says that all those in Asia have forsaken me. One of his dear traveling companions, a man named Demas, having loved this age, departed. He had a few friends who remained faithful. His last request that we have in Scripture is that his young protege, his young disciple, his son in the faith, Timothy, bring me some parchments. I need God's Word. Bring me a cloak because I'm so cold. And eventually what happened to him 
No one stood with them, he said, except the Lord. And eventually what happened is he was found guilty. He was taken out to the Appian Way, and he was beheaded for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is a man who finished well. This is a man who did all that he could do. This is a man getting to see and getting to know. But until that moment, may we all serve the Lord with all of our hearts, faithfully, and let's see what God can do through people who are turned on for Jesus Christ.